Because of Adam's sin, we are born without reason, without sanctifying grace. Our intellect is darkened, our will is weakened, and our passions incline us to evil, and we are so subject to suffering and death. <laughs> Well, in the merry month of May, no from me home, I started, left the girls and chew and nearly broke and hearted, saluted father dear, kissed me darling mother, drank a pint of beer, me grief and tears to smother, then up to reap the corn and leaf, for I was born, could a stout record the vanished ghost and goblets and brand new pair of ropes to rock the love of the bogs and frighten all the dogs on the rocky road, a double of one to three for five, hunt a hare and turn her down the rocky road, and all the way to double and make for all the dogs, in mull and gather night I Rested them so weary, started by daylight next morning, late and there he took a drop of the pure to keep me heart and strength, and that's the paddy's cure. When there is up for drinking, they hear the last he smile, laughing all the while at me curious tale to touch a heart above, and he asked me, Was I hired and wages I required to lie? Was almost tired of the rocky road, to double and one to three for five, hunt a hare and turn them down the rocky road, and all the way to double and white for in double and next arrival. This is a personal attempt to reconstruct with a camera the plight of an island community which survived more than 700 years of English occupation and then nearly sank under the weight of its own heroes and clergy. More than half a century ago at Easter 1916, the Irish made yet another attempt in a centuries-long history of insurrection to break free of England. A rebellion led by poets and socialists, it was one of the first attempts by a small nation to throw off a colonial power by force. It was also the ambition of these idealists to awaken a lethargic and indifferent Irish population to an ideal of freedom. But what came out of that rebellion? The poets and socialists were executed. Finally, after a long struggle in 1922, Ireland won independence of a sort. The treaty with England, which left a piece of the country still under British domination in the north, was not everybody's idea of an honourable independence. The new free state had still to live through a civil war. Then ten years later, led by Eamon de Valera, the Republicans who had been opposed to the treaty came to power, a power they have held almost without interruption to this day. The question now was, what do you do with your revolution once you've got it? It was the hope of the revolutionary generation that Ireland would finally develop a republican form of society. The kind of society that actually grew up was a society of what I call urbanized peasants. Uh, they were a, a society which was without moral courage, with uh, constantly observing a self-interested -inter silence, never speaking in moments of crisis, and in constant alliance with a completely obscurantist, repressive, regressive, and uncultivated church. The result of all this was that 32, like 22, simply spawned uh, a society utterly alien to the ideas of republicanism, and none of us could be satisfied with it. It went on, and it has gone on almost to this day. A society in which there are blatant inequalities, and in which the whole spirit of 16 has been lost. I often feel that if those 16 dead men of 1916, before the bullets crashed into them and before the rope tightened on the neck, had they seen the kind of Ireland that would come out of their sacrifice they would have felt only that their efforts had been betrayed and that their sacrifice had been in vain. One is under no illusions. The Republic is not going to come slowly. It will be the creation of a whole generation, perhaps two generations of younger men, who will have the courage to speak and who won't be afraid of those sanctions that are continually imposed on them if they do so. This was the society we who were born in the 30s inherited. We were told that we were the sons and daughters of revolutionary heroes and that our role now was to be one of gratitude, well-behaved gratitude. 
to criticise the society our old guerrilla fighters had built up was to be a traitor. We were to keep quiet and they, like jolly but tough old uncles, would take care of us. What they expected from us now was a new kind of heroism, heroic obedience. In the 40s, while Europe was tearing itself to pieces, Ireland, neutral, drifted even further from the reality of the outside world. We weren't even allowed to call it a war. Officially, it was the emergency. For us, a tranquil and serene emergency. The 50s brought a deepening depression, unemployment, emigration, an oppressive sense of frustration. We weren't encouraged to look too closely into what had gone wrong. Whatever had been poetic about our new republic had faded, and there was no longer a trace of socialism. We lived in the shabby afterglow of heroic days that had long since faded. But there was still a nostalgia for some of the genteel refinements of the old days. Dublin Society Annual Horse Show. The remnants of a 19th century rural aristocratic society, the Anglo-Irish landed gentry, who once used Ireland as a playground for their expensive pastimes. They dominated the land from the height of their country estates, and we waited on them with horse and hounds. It wasn't only under the Republicans that we learned that to survive, you must at least show outward respect for authority. It's a training that goes back for centuries. We also learn to be devious and to use our charm with cunning. The horse show is still dominated by the Anglo-Irish, but it has become heavily infiltrated with the Irish middle class, with politicians and publicans. But it remains a haven of tranquility, a prosperity expressed gracefully. The Georgian facades that gave Dublin an elegance which saved it from being just another provincial town are being eaten into. 
and people are afraid of what the future might hold. Will you come and awake our dear land from its slumber and her fetters? We will break links that long have encumbered, and the air will resound with hosannas to greet you on the shore. Will be found gallant Irish men to meet you. Will you come? Will you? Will you? Will you come? There's the old problem of what to do with your revolution once you've got it. Perhaps you always have to sink into another kind of bondage. Well, I think the point about Ireland is that it's a rather special small country in that uh, many millions of people in the United States and very large numbers of people also in Britain, Australia, New Zealand come from here so that if Ireland takes a given position and if the position means something, uh, there will be attentive ears uh, to that. And I think uh, Ireland did, and from 1957 on to about 1961, uh, the Irish delegation of the United Nations uh, under Frank Aiken uh, did play a useful part for the relaxation of international tensions. All this, of course, is within the limits of what a very small country can do. Well, an Irish foreign minister, by taking a stand detached from the Cold War and aimed in that particular direction, if you see what I mean, he helped to cool it, as we would now say, inside the United States itself. Because since 1961, uh, Ireland has, in fact, aligned its policy with that of the United States. Ireland goes along on all important matters with the United States. This, to my mind, is both regrettable and unnecessary uh, in that Ireland is not under any real form of pressure from the United States. We're not trying to borrow money from them. We're not dependent on their aid. We don't belong to their military bloc. We could take a line every bit as independent as that of Sweden. Uh, there was also, of course, a special phenomenon uh, at a given time which helped to form this, and that was a certain kind of clerical pressure. Uh, in 1957, uh, when Ireland for the first time uh, voted against the United States on the question of the representation of China. I won't go into the technical details of that, it's a very technical matter. But Ireland did that, and at that time, the Republican government, the Eisenhower government, called out Cardinal Spellman to the rescue to put the heat on Mr. Aiken and his government. Cardinal Spellman used his diocesan press to denounce Ireland for going red and so on. Uh, and this was played back by the sections of the Catholic hierarchy in this country. And the government at that stage took fright. That's what it amounted to. This is way back in 57. Uh, and the, the, in effect, they're still running from the effect of that. Although, of course, this factor no longer really applies. Uh, as I mentioned at the meeting the other night, uh, the Pope is now distinctly to the left of Mr. Aiken and the Irish foreign policy. Uh, but, you know, once, once people get scared, they, they tend to stay scared. Too often, the solution for social problems was to go and have a few drinks. The pubs were for so long masculine purgatories, but now that women are allowed in, things have begun to cheer up.
72 years ago, as a gesture in defiance of the British invader, the GAA instituted a ban on playing what they consider to be foreign games. They also banned looking at foreign games or going to dances run by clubs which played foreign games. This ban is still in existence today. The Assistant Secretary of the GAA. The Gaelic Athletic Association has a ban on foreign games, but uh, it is unusual only when taken in the context of pure sport. 
The rule aims at uh, preventing members of the association, playing members of the association, from taking an active part in these um, English games, which are soccer, rugby, cricket and hockey. The penalty usually is um, a period of six months suspension. If the member in question is a playing member of a team, he cannot play during that six months. And if he's not a playing member, that is say if he's an official or just an ordinary member of a club, he loses the right to participate in club functions. In principle, the rule affects um, approximately a quarter of a million members. Um, the association has over 3,000 clubs. and. Um, it is necessary, of course, to understand that this rule is retained democratically. The association has a democratic system which is even more democratic than the normal parliamentary system. And this rule could be changed any time that the majority of the members of the association wish to have it changed. The Gaelic Athletic Association is, of course, something much wider than a sports organisation. It was founded for the purpose of uh, utilising sport to uh, inject manhood and nationalism into Irish manhood at a, a period when the spirit of the Irish people was very low and very weak after famine and uh, centuries of persecution. the movements which have led to the establishment of the state which we have, have drawn their members, be they fighting members or active political members, from the ranks of the Gaelic Athletic Association. And as such, it has been the reservoir of Irish manhood who have played their part in the evolution of the state. For more than 30 years, we'd been led to believe that the magic potion, which was to restore dignity, identity and confidence to a mutilated republic, was the revival of our ancient tongue, Gaelic. Vast quantities of time and money were spent on this revival, but today, less than 3% of the people speak Gaelic. It became time to live a little less in the folkloric past and do something serious about unemployment and emigration. So while the diehard patriots were still modestly averting their gaze from a game of hockey, the politicians forced to industrialize had to open up the country tax-free to real foreigners. This is the last of the Japanese factories which, like the French and some of the Germans, did not quite manage to set down roots in the newly ambitious republic. But the Japanese were willing to take on a little work on the side. I'm keeping... But at least Ireland, which had lost so many sons to the United States, occasionally gets one back. Since uh, becoming an Irish citizen, I've naturally given some thought to the best ways I could serve my country. And um, as the only thing I know about is filmmaking, why well, my um, speculations naturally took that direction. One day, while we were shooting here on this very location, while the Taoiseach paid us a visit, I took the opportunity to point out that um, a film made by Ireland and Irishmen would be of infinitely greater importance to the country than uh, this foreign film that we were making and still are making here now. Um, it's true, it's 
plowing some million dollars into the economy of the country. Um, but in the long run, that wouldn't mean half as much as um, a native film um, made by Irishmen. year, not only our own paper, but other daily papers uh, have been carrying lengthy correspondences and lengthy articles in and around the pill. And the whole question has been thrown open. This is perhaps the most recent development, about, about a year ago. And you cannot, no censor can stop uh, a, a flow of ideas such as we have now if he wanted to. Perhaps they don't want to. You can push too hard at it. It's a very difficult problem, obviously, for a man, say, in his 60s, whether he's a parish priest or just a layman, suddenly to find things changing so fast under him. There's a tendency here, particularly in rural areas, I'd say, naturally, for the elderly people to be rather appalled and to go rather slowly. Among the younger people, among the younger priests, and I'd say people about 30, in their 30s, say, the tendency is to push very hard. None of them are independent. There are three national newspapers, the Irish Press, the Irish Independent, and the Irish Times, and each one of them is tied more or less definitely to one particular point of view. The Irish Independent is more or less run by the Catholic Church and represents the Catholic Church's interests in Ireland. The Irish Press is run by the largest political party, Fianna Fáil, and naturally represents the government point of view. And the Irish Times, up till about three or four years ago, has always spoken for the hereditary Protestant ascendancy, which uh, the, the Anglo-Irish ascendancy, I suppose you might say. They have tried in the last few years to veer in the direction of a, a sort of an independent uh, newspaper containing comment of a liberal brand from all sections of opinion, but they haven't made a very good show of it, I think. And Their so-called liberalism really amounts to publishing every now and then a couple of articles by well-known Catholics, yeah. and every now and then a sort of a couple of um, so-called liberal assessments of the Irish situation. But if you scratch them, you get very quickly back to the old idea, I think. You, you really want to talk about the news reporting before you go on to comment that every one of these papers does not give you the facts. All we're really interested in in news stories is finding the facts. We can't get it from any one of those papers because their editorial opinion biases their coverage of any event. There was uh, this just recent case of the advertisers, the press and television all caught up in the one thing. There was a program which was, uh, where the producer was thrown off the program, the television sharing. This story was relayed again in the Irish Times in, uh, on the Thursday, yet until last night, uh, no paper had printed any letters regarding this fact. Now, private inquiries uh, have uh, made an absolute certainty that many, many letters were received by the press and by the Irish Times. The Irish Times particularly, which prides itself on its correspondence columns. Uh, there's a, there, is a, there is a fact that Home Truths was a vicious acquiescence by the uh, organization of the state, Radio Television, which is trusted with disseminating the truth, the news, where it gave in to advertisers. Mm. But these people are scared. And this brings yes. you back to the other thing that we were discussing earlier, the same basic attitude that if you have a certain idea and there's another idea that doesn't mix entirely with it, it's better not to mix yeah. entirely with it. It's better to put up a wall, forget about the other man, and raise your own children in peace and in proper beliefs. Yeah. Now, this is nonsense. Yeah, this I, I this, think this think is an this anachronism way. in European terms. Well, you can't. Now we're at the stage where we in the pub can talk about these problems and air them. At the moment, we can't talk about them in the university. We can't get the university itself to talk about them. But more particularly, yeah. these, more particularly yeah. about 60% of the population is never going to be able to get to the university to talk I mean, about yes. them. How can you talk, say that, though? I mean, this is a... a well, well I can say it because it's, it's so... True. It's yeah. a, because it's, it's a fact. A child born in Donegal has one-third the chance of a child born in Dublin of getting to university. And this is irrespective of the fact that they're ahead of a lot of poor children in Dublin. Not only are the national schools supervised by the parish priests, but schools and colleges are, with rare exceptions, in the hands of priests, nuns and Christian brothers. With control of the schools, the clergy's fervent concern is that the child should get a good start in life. Because of Adam's still sin, we are born without sanctifying grace, our intellect is dark and our will is weak and our passions and fine is weak and we are subject to suffering and death. The effects of breathing on sin are as follows. First of all, um, we are made less brainier. 
which means that in this day and age, doctors um, have not yet reached cures for certain diseases. But um, if Adam and Eve had not committed the sin, there would probably be um, a cure for nearly every disease, and people would have no hardship, and there would be no um, stupid people, which would mean that the world would be very rich. And um, Some of the chief uh, dangers to chastity would be um, going around with bad, bad companions who give scandal. Um, wearing very mini skirts, um, um, seeing bad plays and films, or reading books, not uh, when knowing that they are um, bad. The chief danger to chastity are idleness, intemperance, bad companions, company keeping, improper dances, modest stress, and indecent books, plays, and pictures. What will they grow up to be? Perhaps one of them will grow up to be a school teacher and write a book like The Dark, judged indecent three years ago and banned. McGarren was dismissed from his post by a parish priest. The National Teachers' Organization and the Minister for Education abandoned the case. For half a century, one of Ireland's most notorious exports has been its writers. Most of the younger Irish artists are engaged in what I might call a search for an aesthetic, an aesthetic search. They're looking for an, an aesthetic reason for existence as distinct from, let's put it, the purely commercial um, thing into which the country has descended over the last, say, 10 years. This transition is a very distinct one. If I could give examples of the good side of it, for instance, as a young communist 12 years ago, um, the church was able, by using a paper called the Catholic Standard, um, to completely destroy any opportunity for employment of myself or any other communist of the time. <coughs> I recall um, an incident when the front page of a newspaper, at this stage, mark you, I was only about 21, 22, when the front page of the Catholic Standard carried a large statement and a photograph of me saying, this man is dangerous. Now, that might sound funny, but in point of fact, it meant five years exile because I simply could not get a job until I came back as a theatre director. Um, this would not be possible today. It wouldn't be possible because the younger artists, when I say young, I say young to middle-aged artists, just would not tolerate it. It's the ambition of many young theatre people to take over the once world-renowned Abbey Theatre. The Abbey began essentially as an aristocratic theatre. It was run by W.B. Yeats, the poet, and Lady Gregory. Now, it developed towards a proletarian theatre, best example by Sean O'Casey. Now, the bourgeois who were moving in rejected O'Casey and rejected this development of the theatre. It then became what it is, largely speaking now, a theatre of the petty bourgeois. It has no aesthetic, but there is a movement, and there are several movements in the country, um, whose aim essentially must be and the only possible aim is to take over the National Theatre, because the National Theatre, in fact, the Abbey, reflects conditions elsewhere. But it isn't doing so enough at the moment. The Abbey has become, it's enclosed, and it's not really reflecting the great transitions which are taking place in the country, um, because it's still held up. The, the, the old guard, in fact, remain in control. They've got to be removed. All of these authors have had books banned in Ireland.
member of the appeal board of the censorship, the appeal board, which uh, considers cases where books have been uh, banned by the censorship bo board, but where the publisher or the author appeals, or a certain number of members of parliament can also appeal, and that comes before us, and we take the ban off sometimes. Sometimes we don't. Well, there was uh, an old friend of mine, uh, Jimmy Montgomery, a very well-known Dublin man with whom I had many a drink in this very bar, was appointed film censor. And after some years, the sound films came in. And for a while, he had to censor the sound films before the apparatus arrived, so that he had to uh, follow the picture in dumb show, seeing it, but not hearing it. As he said, I only know them by sight, not by sound. And uh, as regards censorship, he used to say, well, yeah, between the devil and the, and the Holy See. Certain countries, like England, seem to have given up all their traditional values, their Christianity, their old traditions of morality and everything, and seem to be saying, or seem to be holding up the point of view that, uh, uh, Oh, that sin, the idea of sin shall be killed, and that all vice, what used to be called vice and immorality, should be allowed and should be uh, acknowledged and should be treated with indulgence and even with, uh, with uh, not even more than indulgence, what shall I say, with, uh, with uh, affection almost. So I often do feel that the world is going to blaze us. I feel that in the modern world that the maintenance of faith in the Christian doctrine is very difficult. The discoveries of science, the advance in philosophy, the, so to speak, the, 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 the uh, adultness of the modern mind and so on, makes faith more and more difficult. And at the same time I feel that if the world has no faith doesn't believe in its own destiny, doesn't believe that it's marching towards something worthwhile, that that would be a very, very serious and, uh, and uh, despairing thing for the world. But on the other hand, there is, uh, there is the resistance. The resistance uh, is the reorganization and development of the church. The church is preparing for the fight, for the, for the future fight against the, uh, the future thought of mankind. And I am full of confidence that, uh, that uh, the, uh, shall I say, that the gates of hell shall not prevail. I think of the text, et porta inferi non prevale bit contra eam. <laughs> Tennis Club Dance Hall is the approved meeting place of young, middle-class men and women who, with the amicable consent of all, have spent their school days separated. It is the women's lair where the men come apprehensively, defiantly, or with extravagant expectations, but not until after the pubs close. Irish women have long accepted, more or less cheerfully, that they have to patiently lay in wait for the men.
way the tennis club dance hall, like the horse show, retains a lot of the old ways. But a favorite meeting place for people of a certain class who value decorum and good manners. Maybe it's true that we're beginning to lose our sense of sin. We are losing our sense of sin, there are still plenty of people who want to do something about it. of Irish politicians with the clergy is not so much a villainous conspiracy as a bad habit. The traditional approach of the clergy has always been not to disturb the simple faith of the people. For generations, the priest has enjoyed an undisputed authority in Irish family life. 
the Vatican councils of the early 60s have badly shaken the Irish hierarchy and the old favourite sport of private mockery but public servility to the clergy has, among the young, begun to develop into public defiance and challenge. Some of the younger priests, with the reluctant consent of the hierarchy, are trying a more modern approach. For two days, we recorded the world of Father Michael Cleary. Well, have you ever passed the corner of a foot and ground Where a little ball of rhythm has a shoe shine stand Everybody gathers and they clap their hands He's a great big bottle of joy He rocks a boogie woogie rag The Chattanoogie shoe shine boy Oh well, he charges you a nickel just to shine one shoe he makes the oldest kind of leather look like new. People feel a want to dance when he gets true. Oh, he's a great big bundle of joy. He pops a boogie woogie right. The Chattanooga shoe shine boy. Oh, it's a wonder that the rag don't tear the way he makes it pop. Oh, you want to see him a flip in the air. Oh, it is how it is. Well, he opens up the business when the clock strikes nine. Likes to get the early when they're feeling fine. Everybody gets a little rag and shine. Oh, he's a great big bundle of joy. He pops a boogie boogie rag. The Chattanooga shoe shine ball. people who have made such a wonderful start. And perhaps I could just remind them of the start they have made to their married life. I'd like to remind Breed and Harry that your first act together as man and wife this morning was to kneel together at Holy Mass. And your first guest as man and wife was Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And you did this surrounded by and supported by the good wishes and the prayers of your, your relatives and your friends. And please God, that will be only a pattern of the rest of your lives to come, that you'll be always close to God and close to his altar, and always enjoying the prayers and good wishes of your relatives and friends. Now, I seem to have got a bit serious. A lot of you really sad. Just to conclude, I, I know that Harry and Breed are two sensible people who realize that life won't be all wedding breakfasts, won't be all sunshine. We will have our ups and downs. But I think I can say for everybody here, for Harry and Breed, that it's our prayer and our good wish this morning for you, that your moments of difficulty, 
And your moments of joy and happiness will be very, very many and very great. God bless you both. particular section of the community that I aim particularly at, the younger folk and the people of that age group who look for in their priest this camaraderie and this ability to sort of understand their their forms of entertainment, their likes and dislikes and one who you might say seems to be on their wavelength. Well, we're not against sex, I mean be ridiculous, you know, we just, uh, in fact, our teaching, we, we try to elevate sex and uh, place it in its proper perspective, give it its proper value. Uh, nowadays, it's so sort of debased and tossed around. Uh, you take, for instance, this young couple who were married this morning. Now, their attitude, and their, their, their training towards sex, will give it its proper place in their lives as the, you know, as the physical expression of a of a love that's genuinely there between them and the proper restraint and the use of it and 
It'll give them more enjoyment than the ordinary person whom you get in some of the big cities. Now, I've worked in London recently, and tradition there now is, you know, you meet a girl, you take her home, you go to bed with her. But uh, celibacy is a problem for the priest. I mean, I personally would like to be married. I would like to have a family. But this is the sacrifice that's involved for me in, in accepting the priesthood. I have seven years to think about it, seven years to prepare and train myself for it. And I believe that I get such a tremendous power from God, the power to recreate or his body in the altar, that, you know, I give him back a gift in return. Now, to someone you love and love deeply and to whom you owe a lot, you don't just give them six months' worth or a shilling's worth. You give them something that hurts, something you feel. And if I didn't miss marriage, all that goes with it, it wouldn't be a sacrifice. Fantastic, you're smart, you're getting close. <laughs> <laughs> you see now, you're out of the good space for a little bit. Come on, pull out your left hand. That's it, Come on, Ginger. Come on, Brian. Come on, Brian. Come on, Brian. Are you expecting a lot of business here or what? Oh, well, oh, I'm well. getting up a bit of stock. Getting up a bit of stock? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what were you thinking well, of? Well, it's hard to see you. I'll I'll see you a cigarettes for you. Yeah. You smoke? <coughs> yeah, well, Come, up that ones, Come up out of that and take a break. Hey. They're no not cheap ones. ones. I got, I got them for nothing. No money this time of the year, you have people coming home on holidays, you know, <laughs> from Lourdes and places. Oh, yeah. Hey. No joke. Go on, you can bury that too. Do you remember that old match we had? Yes. Well, I was thinking if we ran it again, we might make a fit. This was, this was a great yeah. game. Yeah. Hey, Charlie yeah. still accuses us of having a few sort of ringers in, you know? I know, yeah. Because but every man who was there was a genuinely ordained priest. You should have seen some of very experienced footballers, black and blue. But I trot out on the pitch, you see, expecting to see a few baldy married men, you know? Yeah. And who comes out? Joey Wilson, who played for the League of Ireland that year, trotting along. Yeah. But do you remember the time he came down the wing? So just as he was coming, I gave him the, the hip. Yeah, yeah. And he hit the rail and with a bang. Oh, I thought I had him killed. And all the crowd, every time I touched the ball off, it was boo. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Charlie headed a few goals. Here, look at this. Look at that. Head the ball, they call him. <laughs> Tell us now, seriously, though, apart from joking, that I often thought, you know, you fellas, do you get callous towards death at all when you're... Not at all. I mean, you have time no, I've no, no, I've noticed now when I come up to do funerals and that, but even though you must be doing three, four, five a day, you still all stand back for the prayers and, you, you know, you still keep silent and reverence. Uh, you know, I'd imagine you're so used to it to be just another job, you'd walk off and have a smoke or something. Do you still feel, you know, upset when you see relatives upset at a grave and that? No, no yes. really, no. And sometimes you no, do. No, it's only a matter of a job when you're doing it for strangers. When you're doing it for well, strangers, you're... your own, though. I suppose there's one man said to me, you can't die with everybody, I suppose. No. Yeah. But, uh, well, listen, I suppose I'd rather let you get on with the work. No. Well, you hold it up, because yeah. the fellow says <laughs> that if, it, if you don't do the work <laughs> in this place, it'll be a grave situation <laughs> 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 with, with no, no place to put them. I got married when I was 21, and I had, you know, one every year. Um, and then we were married three years, sort of, without a baby. And during that time, we were uh, practicing birth control or coitus interruptus with, with the safe period, you know. And uh, I felt all the time guilty, and I hated it. Well, I went to confession, and I told the priest there that I hated it and I felt I was going mad and all and do you know what she told me to do go home and like a good child and move into another room because as long as you were going to be sleeping with him uh, or the occasion of his sin 
I, I hadn't a hope of holding on to this baby because I was losing so much blood and everything. I don't really feel they should have taken it from me because, I mean, in a lot of ways it helped me an awful lot and the bit of suffering and all. I do, I do. So then I lost the baby and wasn't well or anything and I came home and for a while I certainly wasn't interested in sex or anything because I was too terrified of getting pregnant again. Now most housewives couldn't afford to go to a psychiatrist or analyst or anything. And, he, and even if they could, I think they would go to a priest first and he'd, he'd, he'd tell you go down and offer it up and all, like a good child and do the nine Fridays or a novena or something or other. And I'd say, and I'd say a prayer for you and that's it. And work hard so you won't be, uh, you know, and go out and do the garden and this and that so you won't. You know. <sighs> anyway... They're always on the men's side, and so are the doctors in this country. They, they think women should sort of grin and bear it and push up with it because, you know, they're Catholics and they shouldn't be making it harder for the men to sort of, you know, and be sort of committing sin by having sort of coitus interruptus or something. I'm a practicing Catholic, and I don't think that if I were to uh, get in trouble tomorrow at this stage that I'd go along to a priest or for advice. Hot soup, flag days and raffle tickets are still the favourite solutions of many in authority in Ireland for all social problems. But there are signs that Ireland has begun to take the first steps in breaking free of a political and clerical authority which for half a century had been characterised in its approach to human problems by a profound and stubborn ignorance. Uh, at that time, Dublin was a much smaller city. Everybody knew everybody else. And one felt, when a group sat down in a bar to talk about things in Dublin, one felt wrapped in by the city. One felt as if the city was round a one, like a cloak. Now, that's changed. All this new plastic material, all this machine, regulation of the whole thing and uh, distribution and gen and especially these pop orchestras these these jazz bands these pop bands the strum 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 of these guitars giving us horrible noises oh no I, I think it's awful I think it's dehumanized and uh, and well I suppose uh, to give it its due it is a, a break away from what was into what is and what will be. And I suppose it will all acquire a character. It will acquire a tradition. It will acquire a, a mellowness, which is not there yet. I think that's what's wrong with us, really. That, that's, uh, we're at the beginning of a new age, really a new wonderful age of the world, but at the beginning of it. And therefore, it hasn't, it hasn't any, so to speak, tradition or character about it yet, but it's acquiring it every moment, every day. And uh, uh, I wish it well. <laughs> I wish it well. I won't see it. That's about all I can say about it. Oh, 
show. We will drink and toast to the holy ground and the girls that we adore. We will drink strong ale and water. I may.